All right. Thank you, James. Well, it's great to be with you all today. Um, what we're going to focus on mostly today is economic topics. Uh, however, a lot of you sent in questions from our last session, and there's some really, really good questions here. And a matter of fact, I was talking to James and said, boy, if we were to really answer all of these questions well, uh, it would take a whole session probably. So what I'm going to do is I picked two questions I'm just going to answer at the beginning of this session. Uh, we'll probably devote five or 10 minutes to those two questions, and then we'll jump into our economic topic. And then maybe before our next session next Tuesday, I'll answer a few more questions as well. Uh, here are two questions that are a little bit related that I want to deal with. One was, how do we look at the executive orders from the government officials, such as the shelter in place? And then someone else asked, uh, please explain the three branches of government. And I've chosen to answer these two because they do relate to each other. Now, in the old days when we had kings and queens uh, that ruled, um, the king was the ultimate source of law. You know, the king really, his word was, was law. Uh, the king was not accountable to anybody directly. Uh, the king's dictates were uh, totally control of the country. So the king made law, he enforced law, and the king even was the court of appeals. Uh, but in the um, Reformation, during the Reformation period, a lot of people studying scripture realized that it was not biblical to put too much authority in one person or one human being. And there's some theological reasons for this. One is the sin nature of man, uh, because we know theologically that man does have a sin nature, that uh, it is dangerous to entrust too much power to any one human being. So <clears throat> because of this, the Reformation really brought some of the teaching that comes back from the era of the judges in the Old Testament, which is we have a distributed system of government. Uh, <clears throat> keep in mind during the Reformation, uh, before that time, we essentially had one church uh, led by the Pope. Uh, that was the church at Rome. And one of the things the Reformation was um, arguing against was the authority of the Pope. And the teaching of the church was the Pope was infallible, his word was true, and it was a, a monarchy, basically. It was a kingship in the church. So during the Middle Ages, the church was ruled um, essentially by kingship, and most of the governments were ruled by kings. So we had both church government and civil government uh, being ruled by kings. Well, the Reformation created the idea that no, the Pope is not infallible. Uh, scripture is infallible, but not the Pope. And they also began to recognize the sin nature of man. And so the Pro Protestant reformers uh, had a mindset that they want to have the church ruled by a multitude of people. So you'd have an elder board or a board of bishops. And by the way, this is the model in the New Testament. <clears throat> so the church had kind of lost that New Testament model. Uh, the Reformation brings it back. And so then when they began to realize that in church government, you can't have one person as a dictator or a king, they began to say, well, wait a minute, if the Pope is not infallible, if the Pope is not perfect, can the king or the queen be infallible? And they recognized that, oh, <clears throat> we need to take our principles of church government and apply them to civil government as well. And so we begin to get a mindset where maybe our civil government shouldn't be run by one, one leader or one person. Now, <clears throat> in the American colonial period, uh, they rebelled against England. Uh, signed the Declaration of Independence. And then in 1786 and 7, they began to talk about a new document, a new constitution. <clears throat> and when they gathered to write this constitution, there are representatives there from all 13 colonies. And what they discovered as they were discussing um, how this federal government should operate, uh, several of the colonies came to that meeting and their colonial governments were broken down into three branches of government. Uh, they had created an executive branch, a legislative branch, and a judicial branch. And everyone at the conventions thought this was such a powerful way of organizing a government that it was adopted by the founders in our constitution for the U.S. government. So our U.S. federal government is broken into three branches. An executive, <clears throat> that's the branch led by the president. The legislative branch, that is the Congress, uh, the House of Representatives, and the Senate, and then a judicial branch, and that's our Supreme Court. 
And if you look back in the history text, you'll discover that those colonies that had adapted uh, or adopted three branches of government had done it based on scripture. They had done it based on Isaiah 33, 22. <clears throat> and this is something that's not really taught in American schools anymore uh, because our schools are trying to take God and scripture out of the picture. But in Isaiah 33, 22, we see a passage <clears throat> that describes the three subparts of government rule. Because governments do three things. Governments make laws, governments uh, administer the laws, and governments have adjudication where they resolve disputes. And if you look at Isaiah 33, 22, it talks about God and God's administration over man. And it says, for the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, and the Lord is our king. And those three phrases, we see the three different aspects of leadership or of ruling. It says that God is our judge, that is the judicial branch. God is our lawmaker, that's the legislative branch. And God is our king, that's the executive branch. And so based on Isaiah 33, 22, our founding fathers created a constitution with three branches of government. The executive, which is run by the president, the legislative, which has the Congress, uh, the House of Representatives and the Senate, and then also the Supreme Court <clears throat> and the court system. Now, why is this important to the question I've been asked? Well, the question that we've been asked is, how do we look at the executive orders from government officials? <clears throat> well, if you read the U.S. Constitution, you'll notice it talks about making of laws. There's no mention of an executive order in the Constitution. So at the federal level, when people talk about executive orders, recognize that they're talking about something that's not constitutional. Uh, oftentimes I'll be talking to students in classes and I'll say, can you find me in the constitution, the section that talks about executive orders? And the students look through constitutions and sometimes I'll give that as a homework assignment and the students will come back and say, I couldn't find where the constitution talks about executive orders. And I say, exactly, <clears throat> because executive orders are not constitutional. All laws, are supposed to be made by the Congress. So when we see President Trump up there or his advisors uh, making policies about uh, the coronavirus, uh, keep in mind that any dictates or policies they make that are uh, enforced or have the force of law uh, should have been passed by the legislative branch. So Congress makes laws, not the president. So the way it should be working, if we're gonna do it constitutionally, Congress would have to make these laws and the president would enforce them. At the state level, we have the same problem. All of our 50 state governments are designed in America with the same three branches of government, the executive, the legislative, and the judicial. <clears throat> and yet, what do we see across America? We see governors. We see the executive, the administrative, making policies, making rules, which are essentially laws. Uh, these, in most cases, violate the constitutions of the states. So it's good for us to recognize that the trend in America is away from the checks and balances. And that's a key phrase that we should know is checks and balances. Uh, <clears throat> because the idea is the three branches of government separate power and they act as a check and a balance on each other. And why do we separate power? Well, we do it for two reasons, but the first is because of the sin nature of man because man is sinful. And Lord Acton uh, years ago once said that power tends to corrupt and absolute power tends to corrupt absolutely. So the goal in any government system, be it church government or civil government, is to not concentrate power in any one individual, but to separate it. And most Americans have grown up where students never learned about the separation of powers. Uh, they didn't learn how important it was. And so Americans just accept the idea that presidents take us to war or the presidents set policies <clears throat> on viruses and shelter in place or that a governor does the same thing. And our founding fathers would really roll over in the graves if they knew that our executive branch was making law. Uh, now, so that's a little explanation of the three branches of government and how that relates to the coronavirus. Um, you see this trend where we're centralizing power in our chief executives, which is, is not good. All right, well, I wanna change courses here and we're gonna talk about economics a little bit. 
And economics is important for a couple of reasons. Um, <clears throat> one is a lot of what we deal with in government are economic questions. And so if we're gonna learn about good government, we have to learn about good economics. So I wanna talk about that a little bit. You know, there's a passage, actually lots of passages in scripture that would inform us <clears throat> about economics. But let me start off with just one. And this may be a passage that you may not see how it relates to economics at first, uh, but by the time we're done with the next two classes, I think you'll see exactly how it relates to economics. And the passage I want to refer to is in Proverbs. It's Proverbs chapter 11, verse 1. <clears throat> and Proverbs 11, 1 says, The Lord abhors dishonest scales, but accurate weights are his delight. The Lord abhors. The word abhor um, is not used that much in modern English, but to abhor means to hate something or have disdain for it. So God abhors or disdains dishonest scales. <clears throat> now, what's the vision here? The visual is of a marketplace. And where would you have a dishonest scale? Well, <clears throat> a merchant who's not honest might be selling wheat, and he would have a scale. And on the scale, <clears throat> he would put a known weight, maybe a little lead weight that says one pound or one drachma. And then the other balance arm, he would put a measure of wheat. And you would add wheat until the scale balances. When the scale balances, we know we've got one pound of wheat because there's one, a one pound weight on one side, wheat on the other. The merchant would pour the wheat into a sack and sell the wheat to a customer. This would be done with oats, <clears throat> with any number of other products. Well, dishonest merchants would sometimes take the weight that says one pound and hollow it out. So maybe it doesn't weigh a pound. Maybe it only weighs half a pound. So the merchant would put that weight on the scale that says one pound, but it's really only half a pound. Now he would pour wheat on the other side. When they balance, it looks like there's a pound of wheat there. He would sell the wheat to the customer and charge for a pound. But the customer didn't get a pound, right? <clears throat> the customer got half a pound. Weights and measures have been a common way of cheating people going clear back to the old world. And so that's what's in view here is a merchant that cheats in an economic transaction. <clears throat> and it is an economic um, vision or uh, a visual really, is the Lord hates. It. Well, how does that relate to economics? Well, economics really is how we measure productivity. It's how we measure money. Uh, it's how we measure everything we do in an economy. It is how we determine the rate of pay for an hour's worth of work. And if our economic system is not honest, <clears throat> it would be condemned here because it would give us dishonest scales. And as we cover economics over the coming two weeks, you're going to see lots of ways where our current economic thinking creates a dishonest scale. Well, let's talk first about that word economics. Um, <clears throat> the word comes from two roots uh, in the Greek, and basically one root word means law or rule, and the other root word means the household. Economics really is the rules of the household. <clears throat> so a household might have rules about how you save, how you produce, what you do with what you make, um, you know, how you spend money. So these are the rules of the money or the productivity of the household that is economics. So um, I'm gonna throw a couple slides up here <clears throat> briefly just to give you guys a rundown on a few terms. And I have to give you a couple of boring uh, definitions of terms before we get to the fun stuff. And believe me, economics is and can be fun, so we'll get there. Uh, there's two categories of economics. So we're putting up two economic terms. The first is the term microeconomics. Now the word micro always means small. So microeconomics is the study of the economics of a household or a family or of a firm, uh, a firm being one business. <clears throat> so if you are figuring out economics for your house, you're studying microeconomics. Uh, if you work for a company, let's say you work for McDonald's, the, the fast food restaurant chain, and you're trying to figure out how much to charge for a hamburger, uh, that is still macroeconomics, even though it's a big company. So it's a study of one household or one firm. The other term you need to know is macroeconomics. Macro means big or all-encompassing, and that's the economic study of a whole region, <clears throat> a whole nation, 
or a whole country. And what governments oftentimes deal with is macroeconomics. <clears throat> now, we're going to learn some principles here. We're going to get stranded on a tropical island. We're going to create a little imaginary situation to teach all the economic concepts. And we're going to start off with a very micro economy, and then our economy is going to grow to a macro economy. What I want you to understand with economics is what is true of the small or the micro, the same principle is true of the macro. Uh, and by the way, as I go through this, I think I'll leave some time at the end <clears throat> for um, uh, oral or verbal question and answers. Uh, because our setup doesn't allow me to hear you as I'm teaching, um, uh, I'll you know, only take what, if you have an important question, you can put it on the, uh, the chat and Stephen will pass it on to me. But let's look at one more slide here. Uh, the next slide is going to introduce <clears throat> the term of capital. You may hear people talk about a capitalist nation. Uh, let's define the word capital. Capital is the most important word in economics. <clears throat> capital is defined as either the means of production or of excess production. So if I am a farmer, <clears throat> what is my means of production? Well, it might be a shovel or a hoe, or if I'm a sophisticated farmer, it might be tractors, irrigation equipment. Uh, that is all capital. So by means of production, what we mean is the method of production. So you can think of capital as tools. So for the farmer, the capital might be a hoe or a shovel or a tractor. If you're a building contractor, your tools might be hammers, skill saws, levels, things like that. We can also define capital as excess production. Uh, let me give you an example. Let's say I'm a young man. Starting off, I want to be a building contractor. I want to build homes. I don't have a lot of tools. Uh, maybe all I have is a hammer and a handsaw. Well, I can build a house with a hammer and a handsaw, but it takes me a long time. Sawing all those two befores by hand, uh, wears your shoulder out, takes a long while. So I'm not very productive or efficient because I don't have very many tools. Now, I'd be a better home builder if I had power saws and backhoes and nail guns. And if I am a good businessman, maybe I can only afford the hammer and the handsaw, but I build my first house with the hammer and the handsaw. <clears throat> and then the profit from that house, instead of spending all the profit, I use some of that profit to buy an electric saw or a skill saw. That helps me build the second house faster. Now I have more profit. Now I can use that profit to get a backhoe. And each time I have more profit, uh, I can get more tools. So hopefully capital, the more capital you have, the more productive you are. And by the way, if you want to know why poor nations are poor and rich nations are rich, one of the main reasons <clears throat> is the amount of capital that they have. The more tools you have as a nation, the richer you're going to be. Uh, this is true of a household. The more tools you have as a household, uh, the richer you will be. Now, those might be physical tools. Tools might also be education, um, you know, things of that nature. Okay, uh, we'll leave the slides for a minute and come back to them. Let me talk about a little fun scenario. Uh, we are going to create an economy on a tropical island. And the reason for the tropical island is I want to be separate from the rest of the world. So let's say that Mike Winther is on a, on a little boat or a ship out in the ocean, and um, I have some mechanical problems or the ship goes down. Uh, I find myself swimming in the water holding onto a piece of wood. So I'm floating in the ocean wondering if I'm going to die. After 12 or 14 or hours or so, I wash ashore on a beach. I'm sunburned. I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, but at least I'm safe on this beach. And I collapse and I fall asleep. The next morning, the sun comes up, I wake up, I have no idea where I am. So I begin to explore the island. And I do find some fresh water, some little streams, so I get some water, which is important to me. I spend the whole day walking the island. Uh, it's not very big. And what I discover is that I can, in a day, walk around the perimeter I explored the island and discovered there's no other li living human beings on this island. There's just me. So I end up back after making a circle back on the same beach. I fall asleep. The sun goes down. I wake up the next morning 
here I am trapped on the same tropical island. Well, I've got water, but I am starving to death. So I think, okay, what can I eat? Well, I notice that there's some rocks and some coral reefs out here on the side of the island, and there's fish swimming there. So I think, okay, I'm gonna catch some fish. So I go out there in the water, I wait out, and uh, I don't know if you ever tried to catch fish with your bare hands, uh, but that's not easy to do. <clears throat> I spend all day long, finally about eight o'clock at night, I'm again sunburned and exhausted, I managed to catch a fish. Well, I haven't eaten in three days. I ripped that fish apart, and I have sashimi right there on the beach. Uh, and I fall asleep. Next morning I wake up, and I'm still on the same beach, my clothes are tattered, uh, and I'm hungry again. So what do I do? I go out into the water, and I spend all day trying to catch a fish. It takes me 16 hours, I finally catch a fish, <clears throat> rip it apart, eat the fish, fall asleep on the beach. I wake up the next morning, and I realized that my standard of living is pretty low. As a matter of fact, it's a pretty bad existence. I spent all day <clears throat> just trying to get enough food so I don't die. And of course, there's no one to help me. There's no other civilization on the island and no way for me to get off. So I begin to think, how can I make my life better? And I think, well, I'm spending all day trying to catch a fish. I need to find a better way. Well, I go up <clears throat> off the beach and there's some bushes and trees. And I see a pretty long branch, I break off a branch, and I sharpen the tip of it with a rock, and I make myself a giant spear. Well, I spend all morning making the spear. Now I go out about noon, and the nice thing now is I don't have to get as close to the fish. I can spear the fish at a distance, and by one o'clock, I spear the fish, and I have my sashimi, and wow, that was way easier than spending all day fishing. Sunset comes, the next morning I wake up, and I'm pretty much the same position as I was the day before with one exception. You see, the day before, I didn't have the spear. Today, I still have the spear. So now I go out fishing at eight o'clock in the morning, spear my fish, and I've got my fish caught by 8.15. I think, wow, this is great. I don't have to eat raw fish anymore. So now I take some time, I get some wood, and I get some tinder, and I make a little fire, uh, and I cook my fish. The reason why I have a higher standard of living. And by the way, I have a higher standard of living now because I'm not spending all day gathering the fish and now I can cook the fish. So my choice of sashimi or cooked fish. The reason my lifestyle got better in this last day was because I had a tool. And what was that tool? The tool was my spear. <laughs> that spear, folks, is capital, okay? I developed capital. Now, the spear made me more productive as a fisherman, so then I could build the fire pit. And now the fire pit becomes my capital. So the next day, I can spear my fish with my saved spear, and now I can cook my fish with the saved fire pit. So now I've got two items of capital. In my island existence, every time I create a new, new tool, I'm going to improve my standard of living. Now, as Christians, this matters, <clears throat> because we are told to take care of our fellow man. We're told to feed the hungry. <clears throat> How do we feed the hungry? How do we nurse the sick? How do we clothe the naked? We do all of these things with economic production. And to get this economic production, <clears throat> we need tools. And so I would argue that capital or tools is the key of the biblical mandate to go forth and be productive and to multiply. It is tools that allows us to feed hungry people. Uh, it allows us to feed ourselves. And so I want you to have a good understanding of the importance of these tools. So now, the next day I wake up, I spear my fish, I roast it on my fire pit. By noon, I've had all I want to eat. Now I've got leftover time. I've got free time. So what do I do with my free time? Well, you know, that beach is a little cold in the morning. Even though it's a tropical environment, I'd like some shelter. <clears throat> so now I start to build myself a hut. Well, as it turns out, my excess production is not giving me cash here. It's not giving me money. What my excess production that the capital is giving me is giving me more time. So my profit is really in terms of time. And so as I get more tools, I have more free time. I can use that time to build a hut. <clears throat> and then after I build the hut, on some future day, I can build a cot or a hammock or a bed so I sleep more comfortably. 
so each day I can develop more tools, have more, uh, more capital. By the way, I mentioned earlier the term excess production. There's another word for excess production. It is called profit. <clears throat> and profit was what I had the first day when I used my spear. Uh, now the profit wasn't monetary like I mentioned, but it was profit in terms of time. I profited time. And so each thing I do in my island is going to uh, give me more tools. More tools lets me produce more. As I produce more, I have more profit uh, in terms of time. And what I do with that profit or that time, I use that profit or time to develop more tools. And maybe if I do this long enough on my island, I'd have a beautiful home and a big screen TV and a cell phone, who knows? Uh, but that's how we develop more technology, more tools. Now, let's introduce some other concepts here. Uh, as I live my sole existence, let's say that one morning I go to the beach and here is some other poor soul who's washed ashore. Maybe it's Stephen here in our office. Stephen's washed ashore. He's only half conscious, he's dehydrated. Being the good Christian, I bring him some water and some fish. Um, I get him healthy, I nurse him back to health. So he's uh, now able-bodied on the island. Now, I am not gonna continue to feed him and provide a water for him. If he's able, he needs to contribute to the economy of the island. So Stephen could go out and he could fish every day. <clears throat> so we both could fish, we could each catch our own fish, I would eat mine, he would eat his, and we could have an economy like that. If we operated that way though, uh, I would not be any richer or better off. Uh, and Stephen would never get any richer or better off. But where we both become better off is if we specialize. <clears throat> so I'm pretty good at fishing by now. It makes no sense for Stephen to learn the fine art of, of spearing fish. Well, Stephen notices that there's some tall pine trees, or not pine trees, palm trees. And the top of those palm trees are <clears throat> coconuts and, and various nuts. So Stephen being the healthy young guy that he is, <clears throat> he says, oh, I'll spend my day gathering coconuts. So he climbs a tree, <clears throat> makes some little ropes and some rigging, goes up there and harvests coconuts. Now Stephen's eating coconuts, I'm eating fish. And by the way, I've been eating fish now for several weeks and that's been all my diet. Wouldn't it be nice if I had some other food? And Stephen only has coconuts to eat. <clears throat> Wouldn't it be nice if he had other food? So what should Stephen and I do? Well, we should trade. So at the end of the day, Stephen trades me half his coconuts and I trade him for half his fish. So now my diet consists of fish and coconut and his diet is coconut and fish. I have doubled my dietary variety. I have twice as many foods to enjoy as I had before. You could argue that my standard of living doubled. Why? Because Stephen came to the island and we could specialize. And he'll get better at harvesting coconuts than I ever could. And so when we go from one person on the island to two people on the island, we can actually double our standard of living. Uh, make it better. Now, by the way, as Christians, <clears throat> wouldn't we love to double everyone's standard of living in the world? Well, we can do that because of the idea of trade or exchange. Let me pop up another slide here, and it's the term exchange or trade. I'll use these two words <clears throat> interchangeably. Uh, sometimes I'll use one, sometimes I'll use the other. But exchange or trade is the voluntary act of giving one thing in return for another. <clears throat> so I give Stephen fish, he gives me coconuts. And we improve our standard of living. This is true in the micro economy of our island. The same would be true of a macro economy. So that's the idea of exchange or trade. Um, when I skip standard of living, <clears throat> yeah, go, if you want Stephen, you can go back to standard of living. Um, I think sometimes in Christian circles, because we are taught that we shouldn't be enamored with physical things, you know, we shouldn't be covetous of nice cars or big homes, <clears throat> that we sometimes think that material well-being is a bad thing. That is a misreading of scripture. Uh, we are not to lust or covet material things, but the Bible says that we should trade and invest, 
The Proverbs 31 woman is commended because she engages in the marketplace, she produces. Uh, we're told to save up. Matter of fact, we're told to gather profit and save up to give an inheritance to our grandchildren. So having material well-being is not a bad thing. As a matter of fact, God oftentimes blesses his people when they're obedient by giving them material well-being. So we need to recognize that it's not wrong to have a higher standard of living or material well-being. Okay, the next slide is our exchange and trade, <clears throat> the voluntary act of giving one thing in return for another. Do you notice I used the word voluntary there? What would we call it if it wasn't voluntary? I don't know if anyone wants to chime in with an answer, but if you have an exchange that's not voluntary, what, what kind of trade would that be? You know, someone goes in the bank and they make an involuntary trade, what would that be called? It'd be called theft, right? So if you rob the bank, that's not a voluntary trade. So if I go in the bank as a bank robber, I could hand the teller a note demanding that uh, she give me money or I'll shoot the place up with a gun. Well, I've traded that note for a bag of cash. Uh, the truth of the matter is the bank teller would not do that voluntarily. The bank teller only does that because of the threat of force. So keep in mind there's a big difference between voluntary trade and non-voluntary trade. So the exchange I'm talking about is voluntary. Stephen, in our example, voluntarily gives me some of his coconut. I voluntarily give him some of my fish. Okay, the next slide I wanna put up has the term specialization. Uh, specialization matters. You know, let's say for example, you're having a heart problem and you need a heart procedure. You probably don't go to your auto mechanic or not even to your government teacher <clears throat> to get that fixed. Who do you go to? You go to the cardiac surgeon because this is someone who specializes. And see, we get better health care when we go to a specialist. Um, or if I want my car repaired, I go to auto specialist. I go to mechanic. I don't go to my hairstylist or my barber. We have specialization. And the benefit of specialization is that someone can focus their time and their resources on a specific task. And so they gain efficiency. And the more they do it, the better they get at it. So a good economy has trade and a good economy has specialization. And you cannot have specialization without trade. If we had the world's best heart surgeon, but there was no trade in our system, he would starve to death because he couldn't probably grow food and be a great heart surgeon. Or he couldn't build his own car to get himself to the hospital. It is the ability of people in an economy to trade goods and services that allows for, for specialization. Okay, we can move off of that slide. <clears throat> so let's do this. We have two of us on our island. <clears throat> now, let's assume that a third person washes ashore. Uh, we'll call, it, call her name Jane. So Jane washes ashore. Steve and I help her with some water. Uh, we help her with a little bit of food, get her back to health. Now, what is Jane going to do in her island? Well, I'm the fisherman. Stephen is the um, gatherer of coconuts. Well, Jane looks around the island and says, wow, <clears throat> there's wild berries and things. I'll bet if I watered them and planted and made rows, I could harvest more berries. So Jane goes in the business of producing berries. <clears throat> and so she produces berries. At the end of the day, she has a berry harvest. <clears throat> she can trade me berries for my fish. She can trade me berries for coconut. And now we all have three choices of food groups. We have fish, berries, and coconut. So my diet now has improved from originally just one food to two foods, now to three foods, and we're trading and exchanging and our standard of living gets higher. Now if we add a fourth person to our island, maybe the fourth person is a carpenter. They have carpentry skills. So they start building furniture and huts. And so I trade fish for a bed or for a chest of drawers. Uh, Stephen trades coconuts for the guy to build him a nicer hut. And we begin to trade all these goods and services. Uh, maybe someone else comes to the island and they specialize in wild game. Uh, they discover some pheasants and wild turkeys on the island. <clears throat> so what do they do? They produce pheasants and wild turkeys. And again, we trade all these things back and forth. As we get more people on the island, there's more specialization, more trade, and a better standard of living. 
any questions on that so far before I move on? If there are, you can just type in the chat and Stephen will pass them on. And folks, if we're concerned <clears throat> as Christians about taking care of the poor in the third world, what we're gonna cover here in these next two weeks is really gonna give us a solution to solving the, the poverty situation. And we'll go to some more in-depth concepts on this as we go. Well, let's introduce now the concept of money. So far in our island, we've not had any money. <clears throat> we just traded goods and services. By the way, I don't have a slide on this. But the word for trade of goods and services without money is called barter, B-A-R-T-E-R. -E so that's what we've been doing. <clears throat> now let's say we have maybe 10 families in our island, <clears throat> each producing different things. Barter becomes harder as our economy grows. So let's say that <clears throat> I want some berries uh, from the lady, I guess Jane was her name, that grows berries. And I go to Jane and say, Jane, <clears throat> I'll trade you some fish for some berries. And Jane says, you know what? I just don't like fish anymore. I don't wanna make that trade. Well, if we're dealing only with voluntary <coughs> trade, um, and you forgive that, that's the office phone, so if you hear that, it'll go away in a minute. Um, so if Jane doesn't wanna trade berries for fish, what do I do? I have a problem if I want berries. Well, I can ask Jane, Jane, what do you want? She may say, <coughs> oh, I want turkey meat. So I go to the person who raises the turkeys and say, hey, I'll trade you some fish for some turkeys. And they say, no, we have an oversupply of fish. We're tired of fish. So I ask the person with turkeys what do they want. And they say, well, we want coconut. <clears throat> Great. So I go to Stephen who gathers the coconut and say, Stephen, uh, trade me some fish for some coconut. And he says, no, I don't really want any fish. So what do you want? And he says, well, I want new furniture for my hut. So I go to the guy who makes furniture, and I say, will you trade me some of your labor for making furniture for fish? He says, sure. <clears throat> so I give him fish. He makes the furniture. I give the furniture to Stephen. I trade the furniture that Stephen wants <clears throat> for the coconut. I take the coconut to the lady that raises the turkeys. I give her the coconut. She gives me turkey. Now I take the turkey, the lady that raises the berries. I give her the turkey, and now I've got the berries that I want. You can all see how complex a barter economy becomes when we have a lot of people. So we have a little meeting in our island. Everybody's having the same trouble. We're spending half our day brokering a complicated economic exchange. And we have a little island meeting and say, gee, if we we're back home, we'd have money. But of course, we don't have any money. All of us washed ashore with barely a, a shirt on our backs. So what do we do? Well, we need to <clears throat> divide some system of money. Well, someone notices that there's these little sea, um, uh, shells, seashells on the seashore, the shape of a, a dollar, like a, a um, what do they call them, sand dollars, right? You all seen sand dollars perhaps at the beach. And we think, okay, let's all agree to use sand dollars for money. And there's a few here and there, not too many, but we gather sand dollars. And we all agree to trade sand dollars, it works great. So now when I want to buy berries, I go to the berry lady and I give her the sand dollar, she gives me berries. I don't have to trade for coconuts, for turkeys, for woodworking, to make that exchange. And then she can use the sand dollars and she can buy something else, she doesn't have to buy my fish. Well, this works pretty nicely until all of a sudden we notice that Stephen really is not climbing trees to get coconuts anymore. Matter of fact, Stephen has lots of sand dollars, he's buying everything he wants, but he's just hanging out in the sun on the beach in his hammock all day. And we're all kind of curious as to why he can spend sand dollars not do any work, but we don't give it much of a thought. And so I go to get berries one day and the berry lady says, oh, I'm out of berries. And I says, well, gee, how come you're out of berries? And she says, I sold them all to Stephen. And I says, well, uh, tomorrow, how much do you sell them for? And she gives me a price. I say, okay, tomorrow I'll come back and I'll give you more than that. So I raise the price of the berries by bidding more. She says, great. So I come back the next day to get the berries and I can buy the berries now because I'm offering her twice as much and she turns Stephen down. But the next day I go back to buy berries and she says, oh, Stephen upped your price. So uh, yeah, there were, used to be a $1 basket. Now you offer me two, but now Stephen's offering me three. So for me to buy berries now, I've got to spend $4. So I bid $4 for the berries. And now I'm spending a lot of my money on berries I didn't used to have to spend. I go back the next day and she says, you know, Stephen's up the price. 
he's willing to pay $8 a basket for berries. I can't afford that. So Mike Winther gets no berries. Well, pretty soon we recognize that Stephen and his family are consuming more and more of the goods and services in the island. The rest of us can't afford to buy the stuff that Stephen buys. And the worst thing is there's no coconuts on the island uh, because Stephen's not producing coconuts. So we're wondering how can this be? And then we discover that Stephen had found a secret beach on the island that was kind of overgrown. And on this beach were piles and piles of seashells, of these sand dollars. Well, Stephen had found these sand dollars. He was harvesting them as money and spending them. And what was happening, we were having a phenomena in our economy that we call inflation. Have you guys all heard of inflation? Inflation technically is not rising prices. Inflation technically is an increase in the money supply. Well, our little seashells, our sand dollars, those were our currency. So Stephen had basically, by finding these extra sand dollars, increased the money supply. <clears throat> what was the effect of that? Well, because he was getting a free lunch, uh, figuratively, not a literal lunch, but he was getting free sand dollars, he didn't have to work. <clears throat> and he had a lot of them, so he could bid up prices. And what happened is the price of everything in the island increased because of Stephen's extra sand dollars. And all the rest of us had a lower standard of living. So what happened was Stephen improved his family's standard of living, but he hurt everybody else's standard of living. And there's two mechanisms by which this happened. One was that simply the wealth or the goods and services transferred from everybody else to Stephen. And so we were worse off, he was better off. Uh, the island also was worse off because now we didn't have coconuts. Stephen didn't find it necessary to produce. And folks, this is what inflation does. Inflation makes it so the people who get the new money first don't have to work as hard. And inflation is a wealth transfer. Uh, maybe I should say more accurately, a goods and services transfer. And it transfers goods and services. And the same is true in a micro economy or a macro economy. Whenever you have an increase in the money supply, it shifts wealth, goods and services. And so this is one way that we create poverty because when you create inflation, the first people to get the created money, they can use that money and spend it before prices go up. But ultimately the prices will go up. And you understand on our island why prices went up? When I went to buy berries, there was a bidding war for berries. There was only a certain number of them. And so it was me and the other people on the island bidding for berries against Stephen. And Stephen wanted them bad enough and he had the extra money he could just bid and bid the price higher, and that caused rising prices. And of course, it wouldn't just be berry prices that would go up, it would be everything. Anything that Stephen wanted would go up in price. So the effect of increasing the money supply causes prices to go up. When prices go up, you actually transfer standard of living from one group of people to another group of people. So we have a meeting in the island and say, well, this didn't work very well. Uh, the sand dollars is not a good medium of exchange. Um, so what do we do? And by the way, the reason sand dollars didn't work well is because they weren't scarce. We thought they were scarce, but when Stephen found that beach, they weren't scarce. Well, we could experiment with other things. Maybe Mike convinces everybody that we should use fish as a currency. There's more scarcity to fish. You have to use time to harvest it. So we all agree to use fish. So we're buying and selling with fish as a currency. So even people who don't like fish can buy and sell with it. Well, fish has a problem. Uh, you can't have savings with fish. What happens if I decide to save up for a rainy day or for my retirement? So I earn money, which is fish, and I store it in my hut. What's gonna happen in a tropical climate is that fish that's there is gonna spoil. And now we realize that, wait, you can't store up or save. Uh, the fish doesn't work very well. So fish fails us because it's not durable, it doesn't last. So our first money experiment failed the, the sand dollars because they weren't scarce. Our second money experiment failed because it wasn't durable, it was the fish. And we can kind of go through all sorts of experiments. And what you'll find is that good money needs to meet several criteria. And folks, money is a big part of an economy, so we gotta make sure we get money right. Money needs to be, and I don't have a slide on this, but if you're taking notes, 
Uh, money needs to be scarce to be good money. It needs to be durable. It can't rot or spoil or dissolve. Um, it needs to be transportable. You need to be able to carry it around. Um, you probably don't want to use your, um, uh, your cows as money because it's hard to lead a cow around and, and um, trade with cows. Uh, and good money should be divisible. That means you can divide it into smaller segments. So right now, if I have a $10 bill and I go to the store, I buy a $5 item, we can make that $10 divisible, then give me change for it. So good money needs to be scarce, durable, uh, transportable, and divisible. And the fifth standard is it really needs to have its own value, uh, something that will endure over time. Now, some of you may be thinking right now, the money we use in America doesn't meet all of those standards. <clears throat> well, the paper currency in my wallet, let's see if there's any in my wallet here. Hey, I'm lucky, okay? Here's a, a $1 bill with a picture of George Washington on it. Um, the nice thing about our currency system, <clears throat> it's pretty transportable. I can put a bunch of it in my pocket, and I can take a vacation and spend it as I go. So it's transportable. It's fairly durable. Uh, the birds don't eat it. It doesn't spoil. I can leave it in my wallet for a long time. So it's transportable. It's durable. It's divisible. I've got different denominations. I've got 50s, 20s, 1s. I can break it down to quarters and dimes. So it's divisible. The one shortcoming our money has is it's not inherently scarce. See, this is made of paper and ink. Uh, does anybody feel that paper is very scarce? No, not in the modern world. Now, this is fancy paper, I'll grant you. It's got linen in it and so forth, but it's still not that scarce. Is ink scarce? No. So what's the problem with this kind of money? It makes it possible for us to inflate the money supply. And inflation of the money supply traditionally happened by governments printing more paper bills. They get the printing press running and they just print more of these bills as they go through and the government inflates the money supply. Well, nowadays it's even easier because our money supply is not all just paper money. Our money supply nowadays is a lot of electronic money. You log into your bank account, you see dollars and cents there, you can pay a bill, it's all electronic, doesn't take even the exchange of a piece of paper. So the question is, are those electronic dollars scarce? Well, uh, Stephen can't create them very easily. Mike Winther can't create them easily. But who can? Well, the Federal Reserve Bank and our government can create them easily. So what happens if the government or the Federal Reserve decides to increase the money supply? What would happen? Well, all we have to do is go back to our tropical island and say, well, what happens on our island of 10 people when we increase the money supply? Well, when we increase the money supply, we know that prices went up. And that causes increasing prices. By the way, we know that's true in the macro economy. <clears throat> so when a nation increases, the amount of money in circulation prices go up. By the way, with this COVID-19 crisis, um, the government is spending and borrowing a lot of money. Uh, the Federal Reserve is putting money into circulation. We are increasing the money supply. That will probably result in increasing prices. And by the way, who is hurt worse by increasing prices? <clears throat> well, rich people, are they hurt by increasing prices? Yeah, probably. But does Bill Gates care if the price of his Big Mac goes up by 20 or 30 cents? Probably doesn't matter to him. But if the price of a Big Mac goes up 25 cents, who does it hurt the most? It hurts the poor family. And inflation typically hurts poor people <clears throat> the most. That's why as an ethical Christian uh, population, we should not want inflation to happen. We shouldn't want the money supply to be increased because increasing that money supply causes it to be harder for poor people to afford food. <clears throat> By the way, another role that money performs is it's a store of value. So let's say that I mow your lawn and I put an hour for the time in there and you agree that you're gonna give me $5 for mowing your lawn. So I invest an hour's worth of my labor and you get your lawn mowed <clears throat> and I get a $5 bill back. What I have done as a merchant is I have given you an hour's worth of my labor and you gave me $5.
So now I have that $5 bill in my wallet. That $5 bill represents not just $5. It represents a certain amount of my time, a certain amount of my sweat, a certain amount of my labor. So that $5 represents one hour of my life. Does that make sense? So I can save those. I can mow the lawns and I get $5. And maybe I use $5 to buy food or lunch, but I save that money. And my goal is maybe I want to get a better lawnmower so I can mow more lawns and mow them faster, but I can't afford a better lawnmower. So I'm going to get all those $5 bills. I'm going to save them up. So maybe next year I can buy a riding lawnmower and I can do bigger jobs and I can make more money. By the way, the lawnmower, economically, what do we call that? It's capital, okay? So I'm gonna save up all these $5 bills. Each one represents an hour of my work. So I'm storing my labor, I'm storing that in those $5 bills. What happens if the government increases the money supply? And over the next year, the government increases the money supply by 10%. And if that causes prices to go up 10%, that new fancy lawnmower that I want, what happens to the price of it? It's gonna go up 10%. So let's say that new lawnmower is gonna cost me $500, or would have cost me 500. But because of inflation, it's now $550. What have we done? That inflation has stolen Mike Winther's time because my time was worth $5 an hour. But as inflation happens, now my time is not worth as much in comparison to that lawnmower. So now instead of giving $500 to buy that lawnmower, I have to give 550. We essentially have devalued the money. So as inflation happens, those $5 bills I was saving up my wallet, they were losing value. Every time the money supply increases and prices go up, <clears throat> that money loses value. And this is a concept that may be hard to grasp, but keep in mind that true value, uh, true worth is not in what digit is on this bill, whether it's a one or a five or a 100. True worth is what it will buy. You know, there was a time uh, 80 years ago when a $5 bill would buy several bags full of groceries for a family. Now what does the $5 bill buy you? You know, barely more than a gallon of milk, right? The two bags of groceries for your family have the same value now as they had in 1920. Two bags of groceries feeds my family for a week. That's the value. In 1920, two bags of groceries fed my family for a week. In 2020, that two bags of groceries fed my family. The difference was in 1920, that bag of groceries cost $5. Now it costs $105. Well, the value of the groceries hasn't really changed. What changed was the value of the money. Inflation makes the money have less value. So therefore, I have to give up more money to get the same amount of groceries. So if I'm storing up $5 bills in my wallet from all my lawn mowing jobs, as inflation happens, the value of that money is being lost. And if I store my wallet too long, what happens? It loses more value. So inflation really is a way of stealing someone's labor because we use money as a store of value. I'm storing the equivalent of my time in that money. So if we take away enough value of the money, you essentially are stealing my labor. Uh, think for a moment of slave days. Uh, it could be in any country, but think of slavery in North America in the 17 and 1800s. Why is slavery wrong? Slavery is wrong because the owner is stealing the value of the person's work, right? The slave has to do work and only gets food and a place to live. They don't get the profit, they don't get to save. Their labor is being used by their owner for the profit of the owner. Slavery is wrong because it steals people's labor. Uh, now it also steals their, their liberty. I mean, it's bigger than that, but part of that liberty is their labor. So if it's wrong to have slavery and steal someone's labor, would it be wrong if the slave master only stole half of the worker's labor. Maybe you have an a, a African-American slave and a generous slave owner says, you know what, you're still my slave. You can't go where you want. You can't do what you want. You're going to work for me. But all the profit from your labor, I'm going to give you half of it. It's still slavery, right? You're still stealing from that person against their will 
half of their labor. How about if we steal 10%? Sure, it doesn't matter the percentage, the concept is still there. So if I mow lawns, I save up $5 bills, and inflation reduces their value by 10% a year, you're stealing my labor at the rate of 10% a year. I'm 10% a slave, and that's what inflation does. See, how do we measure productivity in an economy? How do we measure work? We measure it in money. Go back to that passage I read to you out of Psalm, I'm sorry, not Psalms, Proverbs 11. The Lord abhors dishonest scales. What does a scale do? A scale measures something, right? It measures wheat. What does this paper dollar do? It measures things. It measures how much time I spent mowing lawns. It measured how much I'm gonna buy. It's a measurement that helps us in the economy. <clears throat> paper money or any money is a measurement just like the weight that goes on those scales. So if we hollow out that one pound weight as a merchant, so it only weighs half a pound so we can sell wheat and we can sell half as much for the same amount of money, we're stealing, right? That's a dishonest scale. If I'm a merchant with a dishonest scale, I'm stealing. If I'm a government that makes the money lose its value, that's a dishonest scale because the money is the way we measure what happens in our economy. <clears throat> it's how we measure exchange. It's how we know how many baskets of berries is equal to one fish. You know, it may not be one fish, may not be equal to one basket of berries. A basket of berries might be worth $5 and a fish only one. So in that ratio, we know it takes five fish to equal one basket of berries. We measure those ratios with money. And that's why money needs to be sacred. It needs to not be manipulated by governments. It needs to be fixed. We can't allow an inflation to happen because it is a dishonest scale. Now, the applications of this are huge. Let me get practical here, and we'll try to save a few minutes just for question and answer here in just a minute. But um, in response to this COVID crisis, what is the government doing? Is pouring money into the economy. Well, if you're one of the people that gets that money, that's nice, right? You're like Stephen, you're getting something for, for nothing. But the trouble is that money cannot be given and is not given equally to society. So some people will get more of the created money than others. And that created money is gonna increase prices for everybody. So this, when our, back to our example, when Stephen found all those shells on the seashore, so he had all the, the free money, did Stephen mind the prices were going up? No, he could afford it. And he was the reason the prices were going up, right? <clears throat> so he didn't mind. So if, if I was to give you a $5,000 gift, would you mind if prices went up 1%? Probably not. The $5,000 gift would be worth more to you than the 1% price increase. But what if you don't get the $5,000 gift and prices go up 1%? Now we have a problem. And see, governments, when they inflate the money supply, <clears throat> there's never been a method of doing it that allowed everyone to equally get the new money. So some people get more of the new money than others, and yet the price increases, they hit the economy, hit the economy as a whole. So everybody faces the higher prices. This is one of the reasons why inflation creates inequality in a society, and it creates theft. And so as a response to this COVID crisis, the government is doling out dollars everywhere, and their hope is to give money to a lot of people. But the problem is not everyone's getting an equal share. Um, and not every organization, every business gets an equal share. And therefore, it redistributes wealth. So those who get more of the money, they can afford the higher prices. Those who get less than the money uh, can't afford the higher prices, and they're economically worse off. So we're gonna go in, in future classes and we're gonna talk about supply and demand and price and we'll move from our tropical island and uh, we will probably start next time by comparing two economic systems. We'll compare socialism and communism, which is the system primarily in China, uh, to the free market economic system. And there's only those two economic systems. <clears throat> we'll introduce those concepts, how they're different, and then we'll go back to our island and the 10 families in our island, we're going to experiment with a socialist system first, and they'll experiment with the free market. And I think what you'll be amazed at, it'll become so clear to you, and I'll have some PowerPoints and charts and graphs, 
it'll be so clear to you why socialism reduces productivity, while socialism increases poverty. And you'll see it firsthand on our little tropical island to 10 people, and then we'll extrapolate that out to a, a worldwide economy. So by way of, think of questions you may want to ask. Uh, if no one has questions, I have other material I can present right now because we'll be done at 1.30. But let me just quickly review key terms. Capital. Capital is tools. Uh, it is the means of production. And we get more capital by having excess production. Our economy is better off when we have more capital. Our economy is better off when we have more specialization of our labor. And our economy is better off if we have more trade. And <clears throat> trade is an important part of that part of an economy. So those are the key points to review. And then money, what is money? It's the medium of exchange. It's a way of exchanging goods and services so we don't have to barter. And don't forget that term barter. And barter worked great when it was just Stephen and I on the island. And barter works okay if you just have two or three producers. But if you have a lot of people producing, barter becomes very inefficient. Then you need some sort of exchange method, uh, which is money. And good money should be scarce, it should be divisible, it should be transportable, it should be durable, and it should have its own value so its value maintains over time. Uh, and in America and a lot of nations, we inflate the, inflate the currency, which causes rising prices. So that's the content I absolutely needed to get through today. Um, and Stephen's gonna fire some questions at me and we'll answer those questions. Let's go to the TD question, you can unmute me. Okay, someone asked um, what Christian's view should be of TD, and we're assuming that means trade. Whoever wrote that question, can you clarify? <clears throat> is TD, is that what you mean by trade? Yeah. If oh, sorry, I was, um, I was writing that question, but my intention was to ask, should Christians uh, embrace the idea of one world economic system? Clarify, she said, to Christians. Okay. This is a great question. Um, whoever asked this question should get an A for the day, okay? Um, because there is this issue about trade in the world, uh, trade within a nation. Uh, one of the things you discover is the more people you trade with, the better you are off economically. So there's this question, uh, there's lots of words for it, uh, called globalism is a term you hear used, or one worldism. Economics from government. I think that trade all across the world is fine. I believe it's Christian. Uh, economically, there's nothing wrong with it, as long as the people trading are doing so voluntarily. Now, if one of the trading partners is a slave, you know, that would be something else. For example, on my island, let's say Stephen has this whole plantation where he grows coconuts, and his coconuts are being picked by slaves. Uh, then I should not be trading with Stephen because uh, the workers are not voluntarily giving their labor. <clears throat> so the clarification point I would make is that the bigger your circle of trade, the better off you are, but you only want to make sure it's a voluntary trade. <clears throat> so I would argue that broader circle of trade, as long as it's voluntary, is good. However, I would not argue for political globalization. Some people say to get global trade, you need one world government. And the answer is no, you don't. You know, we have a different government in Santa Clara County than we have in Stanislaus County. We have a different government in California than Nevada. <clears throat> we can trade uh, citizens who are in different governments. Uh, and I think sometimes we think of trade from a government perspective, Keep in mind, governments should not be trading with each other. Governments should not be engaging in economic exchange. Who engages in economic exchange? Individuals and businesses. So all trade ought to be private trade. Governments should not be trading with each other. So here's talk about the US trading with Japan or with China. Consider that really in a proper world, the United States government does not trade with the Chinese government. 
it should be a consumer in America trading with a producer in China or a company in China trading with a company in America. That would be voluntary non-government trade. Governments should not be big. I would never support bigger one world government uh, for a couple of reasons. The biblical model of government, which if we do future classes after economics, we can talk about this, but the biblical model of government, if you go back to the Old Testament, is that governments should be as local as possible. They should be decentralized. So we don't want bigger governments. What happens, the bigger a government gets and the more centralized, the more temptation there is for evil people to take more power. So I think governments should be small and decentralized. Uh, I would not advocate for one world government. I oppose these efforts to <clears throat> have the United Nations become a government over the whole world. I think our government should be small and decentralized. Uh, so small, limited government, not global government, but global trade amongst free people. Next question. If executive order is not constitutional, given the situation of COVID-19, what should government do? Nothing or how much should government do? Yeah, great question. Um, so question is, uh, if executive orders are not constitutional, <clears throat> what should the government do about a virus like COVID-19? There's really two questions here. Um, the first question is, what is the proper role of government? And on this issue, we've not really addressed that question, and I probably need more time than we have today to address that. But just keep in your mind, the first question is, is it proper for a government to force a quarantine? That's the first question, which we'll put on the table for another time. <clears throat> The second question is, if it is proper for government to do it, how should government do it? And to that second question, the answer is, it should be an act of the legislature. Uh, at the federal level, our constitution only allows Congress to make law. So if there's gonna be federal laws, <clears throat> they should be passed by Congress. Uh, the president would have to sign the law, uh, and if he vetoed it, didn't sign it, Congress could override the veto, but the law should come from Congress, not the president. And the same is true in California or any state. It should not come from the governor. It should come from the legislative branch. <clears throat> so if it is proper for government to uh, force us into our homes or regulate our meeting, and you might guess that Mike Winther doesn't think that's entirely proper, which you'd be right. Um, but if it were proper, it's still not proper for the chief executive to do it because we need division of labor, separation of powers. And separation of powers says the person who enforces the law cannot be the person who makes the law. So the lawmakers, the law enforcers, and the judges have to be three separate branches of government. So if we were gonna have the COVID actions, the California legislature should be making those decisions. Good question. Okay. Any other? Questions, you guys get an A on questions. Anybody else want to throw another question in the chat room? Or you can talk and Stephen can hear you and he can pass it on to me. There was one other question that you asked. Do you think it's a Catholic way of Christianity as well? I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, question on the queue. I talked a little bit about <clears throat> the Catholic Church and the Protestant Reformation. Uh, someone asked if I think the Catholic, um, what was the phrase, Stephen? The Catholic way of Christianity is wrong. Um, I, I believe the Catholic Church gets a few things, few things wrong. Um, uh, Catholics are Christians. Uh, don't, don't doubt that at all. Um, but there are some issues. Catholics tend to mix a little more works into salvation. Uh, not all Catholics, but the official policy of the church basically says you're not saved by faith alone in Christ. Uh, you're saved by faith in Christ and some level of works. And this is one of the complaints that the reformers had against the Catholic Church, was that uh, they were teaching a salvation that mixed in works. And I think scripture is pretty clear. Uh, we're saved by faith and faith alone, and that even our best works to the Lord are filthy rags. Um, so I would take issue with some of the doctrines of the Catholic Church. Uh, there is another issue just by the system of government. And I wouldn't say it's wrong, but it's dangerous. The Catholic Church, by putting so much of their power in a centralized place, in the Cardinals and the Vatican, they've centralized power. And whenever you centralize power, 
Satan is always going to level his biggest attack at the seat of power. So if you look at all the Protestant churches around the world, there are, what, millions of separate Protestant churches. Satan is limited in time and space. He's a created being. So Satan cannot meddle in a million churches all at once. But if all those churches were merged under one human organizational chart with a central body, Satan wouldn't worry about all the individual churches. Satan would try to corrupt the head of the church and let the human organizational chart filter down Satan's corruption. So I think we make ourselves more vulnerable to Satan's meddling when we centralize power too much. Uh, and that's true with church government. <clears throat> it's also true with civil government. So I'm not sure if that's a good answer to the question. The voluntary exchange may not work, Stephen, too much. Yeah. Okay, here's a great question that really comes down to charity. So the question is, um, if Stephen's not in a condition to produce, and he needs to live in Mike's hut or needs Mike to, to feed him. And a key question about civil government is, who handles charity? Um, that I have a whole two-hour lecture on that. Um, let me give you the real shallow version, and then uh, if we go longer uh, or more classes, we can address that. Uh, nowhere in scripture do we see the government given the role of charity. Uh, there are levels of charity. Uh, we're called to help our neighbor, so we're called to individually be charitable. Our families are supposed to take care of each other. Uh, scripture says if you don't provide for your own family, you're worse than an unbeliever. And then the church is supposed to take care of people in need, and then other voluntary groups and associations. And when I teach on this, a lot of people say, oh, that would never work. <clears throat> you, know, you can't just have voluntary charity. Well, the truth of the matter is it's been tried, and it did work. Uh, there was no government charity programs in America for 140 years. Uh, charity in America was done voluntarily by churches and neighbors. And what we found was there was less poverty uh, in that era than we have in this era. And what happens is our government charity uh, it's not a proper role of government, and our government charity messes with some economic concepts and actually creates more poverty. If I cover material quickly <clears throat> uh, next week, I'll try to go through the economic model and demonstrate why that is. But good economists will tell you that government charity actually produces more poverty than it solves. And uh, it's not just one or two economists. It's, it's hundreds, maybe thousands of PhD economists <clears throat> have done work on this in America and all concluded that the more government charity the government tries to do, the more poor people you create. And that's why a lot of people in government want more government charity, it creates more dependence. And the last thing I'll say on that, when a Christian or a church provides charity, who gets the glory? If we're doing it well, God gets the glory. It is a great method of evangelism. But when government provides charity, who gets the glory? Not God, not the church, but government. And so Satan does not want the church providing charity. Satan wants charity done by the government, so God's not glorified and the gospel's not heard. And as a church, we should fight to get charity back because charity is one of the most powerful evangelistic tools that we have in the church and a way that we can glorify God. Okay, <clears throat> Stephen tells me no other questions in the, <clears throat> the chat room. Anybody have just a an oral question just to fire off. We have six minutes before we'll sign off. And until somebody pops up with a question, I'll just make a couple of comments. Uh, some people tend to separate economics from morality. I don't know if you've heard this or not, but a common um, <clears throat> American phrase on election day in comparing two candidates is someone might say, well, this candidate is good in the moral issues, but this other candidate's better on the economic issues. And what they mean by that <clears throat> is to say that, well, this candidate's good on spending and debt and deficits, but this other candidate's better on moral issues like abortion and homosexual marriage. <clears throat> and we tend to make this distinction that there's moral issues over here and economic issues over here. Folks, that's a false distinction. Economic issues are moral issues. How you deal with money is moral. <clears throat> Who here wouldn't argue with me if I went to 
go and rob a bank if I said that was a moral issue? I mean, uh, robbing a bank is economic, right? It's money, but it's also moral. And so every economic question is an ethical and a moral and a biblical question, <clears throat> just like losing the value of our money. Okay, we're stealing people's labor. Is stealing people's labor by reducing the value of the money, is that an ethical issue? Is that a moral and biblical issue? And the answer is yes. So I don't think you could find an economic issue where there's not a biblical principle at the core. So as Christians, we need to get rid, get rid of that mindset that makes us think that there's moral issues and economic issues. No, economic issues are all moral issues. Yeah, Stephen. Okay, the question is, what would I say about religion having to do with the economic success of a country? Uh, yes, that is a key factor. <clears throat> and the reason why is a religion that teaches good economic principles, that nation will be blessed and that nation will prosper. <clears throat> if a nation is dominated by a religion that teaches bad economic principles, <clears throat> then they'll lose productivity, they'll lose capital, they'll have poverty, and they won't be blessed of God. So uh, I think America was very prosperous. If you look at the 1800s uh, and even the 1700s, <clears throat> America was more prosperous than other nations, not because our people were smarter. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> genetically, it's probably true that we were less smart. Uh, it wasn't even necessarily they worked harder. It was that we had a different economic system. <clears throat> and the economic system in America in the 1700s and 1800s, although not perfect, and it didn't always follow the biblical model, it was closer to the biblical model than most other nations. And uh, a biblical model supports private property. A biblical model supports specialization. A biblical model supports accumulation of capital. And to accumulate capital, you need private property. Uh, next week, we'll talk a little bit about who owns property. Is it owned communally, like in a commune, as the communists would have? Or is it government controlled, like the socialists would have? Or is it privately controlled? And uh, time permitting next week, we'll go into those models. Uh, the Bible is a document that teaches the importance of private property. People own their individual property. And an economic system that values private property will prosper. Uh, and just to tease everybody, taxes. You know, the Bible doesn't talk about <clears throat> the income tax or sales tax. But the Bible does tell us what the maximum tax rate should be. This is something most Christians don't even know. Uh, but there is a, a principle in Scripture about a percentage, an actual percentage of the maximum tax rate. So Lord willing, next time we can talk about that. Okay, we are at 128 by my clock. Uh, what I think I will do is I'll close this in prayer. And uh, hopefully the sound was better uh, this time than last time. We have a lot more equipment and a lot nicer setup. I think the only shortcoming in our setup is the way we are. <clears throat> I don't have an earpiece that uh, lets me hear you. Uh, maybe we'll work on that for next class. We will do this again at noon next Tuesday for 9 I appreciate you. Uh, I think Stephen, if he hasn't done it already, <clears throat> will post in the chat room uh, the IPS website. Is that doable, Stephen? Uh, if you want to make a donation to IPS, there's a donate option on the website. Also, you'll find some articles and some other audio recordings that you can access. What's that? Okay. Stephen says there might be one more question coming in, which if it's quick, I'll do before we pray. Okay. Yeah, go ahead and fire away if you have a question. Just you can speak it. Stephen will play it. Okay. Well, let's close in prayer. Um, praise God for... Uh, the principles he gives us, and help us to have a desire to, to learn those. Let's, let's go before the throne. Father, we thank you for this time. Father, thank you for these people who are willing to uh, engage in this class in the middle of the day. God, I pray that you would bless us with a hunger to know truth. Uh, God, would you give us a desire to want to be productive Christians? Give us a desire to want to reach the third world, and to be able to share prosperity with people who are hungry and starving. And God, as we teach good, sound principles of economics, help us not only to learn them, but help us to learn where they come from, 
so that when we give people good uh, principles, good systems, we can point them back to the Bible where those principles come from. We can point them to the Creator and to the Savior. Uh, God, help us to minister to all our neighbors through this way. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you, everybody.